Greetings, and bienvenue, Midna crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Can we start a real screwed up story thread? No ghosts, Shadow Man. Scary noises. Real life things that involved real people. I don't know about you guys, but that shit's much scarier. A missing persons case a few years ago, my dad is a veteran search and rescue volunteer for the county. Anyway, the man was missing for months and finally a local found his abandoned car deep in the woods on a very old dirt road. An area so far away from anywhere that you can see hundreds of thousands of stars in the night sky. The car was abandoned as if he were to come back to it very shortly. Along with the door being wide open, his glasses, lighter, and a couple other things I forget at the moment were left on the seat. However, the car has tiny amount snow inside, and the keys were in the on position in the ignition. After examination by the police, the tank was shown to have been run dry, and battery had been drained, potentially indicating the lights had been allowed to drain the battery after a good while, if not also assisted by the radio. Eventually, my father and the other searchers found his tracks, which were judged by the group of eight man trackers with 35 years experience for each of them to be recent. The weather in the areas had been fair for the past week, with no precipitation and very little wind. It was very cold though, most nights had an average low of about negative 30 to 35 Celsius. After a day they followed the tracks, which had gone quite a ways to large open and frozen with snow cover lake. That's where the tracks just stopped. There were no foot tracks or even snowmobile tracks which would have been visible for quite a while. No more evidence was found. Here's mine. Walk home from the bar at around midnight in January. Not much of a drinker. Walk past Bum, classic looking Bum Brown ratty shirt bag of unknown alcohol. The only thing missing is bags on his freaking feet. Who starts walking with me, striking up a conversation? Just having normal conversation about things like weather and the price of alcohol and women I once loved. Out of the blue, the Bum says, They're watching you, you know. They watch us all. Think, LOL crazy government aliens, Bum, smile and ask, who? Bum looks at me and says, your ancestors, they can see all the good and bad things you did. A little weird, but okay, ask Bum, really, and how do you know and what do they say? Bum says he was a medium who could see distant dead relatives, says ancestors are proud of me and not to worry about life so much. Bum says demons constantly follow him and get him to do bad things to living people as balance for the good. He can tell them about their dead relatives. Ah, crazy bum dot PNG. Get home and bid bum goodbye as I go to my apartment. Bum yells after me. Just watch, they will come for you one day. Go up to the apartment and go to bed. Around 4.30, get up to pee. Look out the window in the same bum just standing across the street staring at my apartment building. Think it's weird, but screw it. Go back to bed. Wake up to nature's call again at around 5.30. Damn alcohol. Look out the window and Bum is trying to scale the bricks up to my window. I live on the third floor, so it's not too high. Call the cops. Cops come and escort Bum away. Not a very scary ending, but the thought of someone standing in the cold staring at where I live for hours, then finally trying to break in freaks me the hell out. I have another missing persons case that happened right within my building. A man who lived downstairs had been reported missing by his roommate. He was concerned after he left the evening before without his cigarettes, keys, jacket, and wallet. Two weeks later, the man was found barricaded within a storeroom on the ground floor. It was very cool in there as the bottom floor is partially below ground, so the body had not decayed very much nor any insects had gotten to him. Personally, I found the smell of death to be quite faint when I was in close proximity to the body and its removal. The building had not been searched or by the police, nor were the residents questioned before the body discovery. This is standard procedure. The roommate was seen several times outside the storage room, however. The man actually stored his bike in the hallway of the many small closets in the storage room. There is no lock to the main door of this room. The closet the man was found in was said by police to have been unlocked, but barricaded in a way which would have been impossible to do from the outside or exiting the closet. I am concerned as the closet is one side concrete and the other undamaged and sturdy wall. The man was a known schizophrenic and had been jokingly asking for $5,000.
Residents, including myself, clearly remember him recollecting a past where he left town owing the Hells Angels $5,000 in the late 70s in the past year. He had been there the entire time, under our noses. A story my mom told me about her cousin's murder. My mom and her cousin moved into a new house in 1987, 7th or the 8th of October in Melbourne, Windsor Avenue. Now my mom is very sensitive to paranormal things, but growing up in a war-torn country before coming to Australia, she kind of shuts it out. She always said, real people are scarier than ghosts. Anyways, the two moved into this house, right? Normal stuff, except at night my mom could hear the shower run and she asked her cousin many times if she was showering, but her cousin said no. One night, she stayed up and turned all the lights on. The same thing happened with the showers, so she sat in front of her bedroom door, and once the shower finished, a shadow flew past. She ran to her cousin's room and told her something is not right in the house, but her cousin shrugged it off. Next day, she had school and went to school, etc. She walks home by the way with her friend. They arrive at the gate and my mum freezes. Something is wrong, Anon. She said over and over, but her friend said she was too paranoid. They went to the door and she had a ring of keys. She inserted the house key and the rest of the keys fell off the ring. Impossible. She nudged the door and it opened by itself. She could smell something. She walked through the hallway and it hit her. Blood. She could smell blood. She opened her cousin's room and her cousin was found dead with blunt trauma to the head and multiple stab wounds. Mum found the weapons under her bed. I know I'm trash at writing stuff, but I thought I'd share. The kicker is her cousin who died on the 15th of October, the day I was born. When she told me the street name, I could see the house she was talking about like I've been there. I got only one more story, it's just odd, not really screwed up. Me and my friend thought it would be a good idea to bike the Cape, a long loop of back roads. We came upon a spot which was very unleveled and chaotic. There were several boulders in the ditches of the road. It just felt uncomforting. Just at a sharp turn, I saw a hand pump sticking out of the ground on an offshoot road. I convinced my friend we should try it to see if it works. He didn't want to because this place just gives me the creeps. I heard a couple yelps from animals in the distance as we biked up to the pump. Turns out it was a well-concealed camp. I heard what I thought was a yell of pain. I figured it was the sounds of the pump or a tree. My friend said he was hearing odd sounds by the boulders which were easily explained as natural. Then the resident of the camp came out to see us. It was my bus driver, a 67-year-old man. He told us it was odd we wanted to bike the Cape and that we stopped here of all places. We told him that we needed water, we were getting fatigued and starting to hallucinate, hearing those sounds and our general feeling for the area. He crooked an eyebrow and started to tell us where we were. A couple decades ago it was known as Dead Man's Corner. Lots of people have died around this sharp bend in the road, beneath where his camp is. He told us few people went off the road there. One man rolled his truck into the ditch and succumbed to his injuries. Another also rolled into the ditch, upside down. He drowned as there was heavy rain, and the corner is also where a stream redirects when it overflows. It apparently was the line of the stream before it was redirected from the road. Is that why there are so many boulders in the ditch because of the stream? I asked. No, he said. Those were from when the road was being made. Name I forget. Found a huge builder in the ground which would have been impassable. About 30 or 40 years ago, add 10 more to get this present year. He tried to blast it, but the dynamite fizzled. His colleagues and him waited, and waited and waited, but nothing happened. Eventually, he told those guys to go home so they could have supper. He must have waited three more hours for the dynamite to blast before he thought it was a dud. The blast which blew him, and the huge boulder apart to the small ones you see today was heard at dusk. Did you make your camp after all this happened? Yes, but there used to be a home down in this clearing behind here. I moved three feet to the left and saw a clearing with a gargantuan cross erected. My bus driver told me there used to be a home there and a couple others nearby ages ago before he was even born. There weren't any camps out on the Cape nor much of a road then. I think he told me there was an older road before. Anyway, I asked why there was a gigantic cross there, and he told me that one is a rather sad story. A man lived there with his wife and two children and the man one day went insane, so they figured. The neighboring homes heard several gunshots and the men headed there with their guns to see what the ruckus was about. This was a day and age that bandits were always a feared potential, albeit very rare. Anyway, as they approached the home, they heard the man laughing maniacally and the door was firmly locked. 
Someone looked into the window and saw the entire family lying on the floor, all in their good clothes, with the man eviscerating his wife. He soon noticed his neighbors looking in horror through the window who had gathered to see what was happening. He was smiling from ear to ear, laughed even more, then kicked over an oil lamp which began to set the home on fire. There must have been additional oil on the floor, I think. By then the men were trying to break open the windows. The man, he calmly climbed up onto a chair and hung himself on noose he prepared, his neck snapping with a ghoulish grin on his face, and soon the house became engulfed in flames. He then told us that his neighbors shortly abandoned their homes, which you can still see the cellar for one that way. He pointed directly into the woods. He told us that he heard that story when he was our age, and it was pretty old by then too. He didn't know who erected the huge cross, but thought it might have been the neighbors, but it also could have been the village people. It had been too long to remember all that well. All he remembered is that the neighbors moved away very quickly. As they had become afraid of living in the area, I asked him how he had a camp here. He said he wasn't afraid. Not much has happened here. It's just a place with bad coincidences over several decades, boy. The home you live in was right beside your house where the couple burned to death. Things happen. Uncomforted by the stories and the discovery that he hollowed the basement in the field by my house was the result of a deadly fire. Me and my friend wanted to get back home as soon as possible. My friend wasn't even speaking, but shaking really. He wanted to leave more than I did. I asked the old man, my bus driver, which was the fastest way home. He said we were exactly halfway. We groaned and tried to bike the rest as fast as we could. We never biked the cape again. I post this every once in a while. Not really paranormal, but still a little creepy. B-15, sleeping in my bed. Wake up to dogs going crazy. Look at the clock. 2.30 a.m. WTF. Hear parents running around the hallway talking frantically. Walk into the hallway. Mom in a robe looking freaked out. Little brother in underwear crying. Dad running around in underwear with a baseball bat. Pounding at the door. Dogs going crazy. WTF is someone trying to break in. Dad is yelling that the guy has the wrong house and that the police are on their way. The guy is just kind of moaning back, still pounding on the door and trying to turn the knob. On dog, Beagle howls. Dude howls back. WTF? Quickly find out the dude is definitely drunk. Wait for the police to show up. They show up, start questioning him. They ask his name. Jake Bertman. Blah blah other questions. They cuff him. After he's gone, mom goes, did he say his name was Bertman? Turns out he lived in our house before us. He was put into foster care after his parents died. His drunk ass managed to drive back to his childhood home exactly 20 years to the date that his parents were killed. Scarier part was that if our door wasn't locked, we usually didn't keep it locked, we live in a quiet suburban area. He would have walked into the house and gone straight to my room. I'm 21 now. I keep my door locked even when I'm home now. I used to have this blank theater mask that I put on while standing in front of people's houses in the middle of the night, never saying or doing anything except trying to get eye contact with the people who were up at that time. Sometimes I used got a scared face or startled screaming, but mostly I went unnoticed. Carefulness was important, so I only went out at random dates in different neighborhoods. The thing is, this one time a guy actually came out to meet me. I was going to run away, but when he opened the door, he just stood there looking me in the eyes. It became a game of chicken, but I didn't budge. He seemed delighted that I stayed, and took a step to the side, signaling to me that I could come in if I wished. However, I had noticed that he wasn't wearing any form of nightly attires. He was fully closed shoes included. The thought hit me that maybe he didn't live there. So I ran, and once I came home, I got rid of my mask. I still can't forget what he shouted at me as I ran. Why are you leaving? Aren't we the same? Maybe he just liked screwing with people too and wanted to swap techniques. Personally, I really enjoy messing with people like that as well, mainly to my family. This one time I was with my GF, and we were walking round to my cousins. We live pretty close by, so it takes like five minutes. It's dark because it's night and there's no street lights in my village. As we come up on the house, I have this great idea. I tell my GF to go to the house and ask them if I came earlier, then to just take it from there. I ran round the back of their house and watched as she entered from their garden. I see them talking and watch as she explains how I left to come here earlier, but clearly hadn't arrived. The cousin about my age starts to get freaked out. He knows I like to play games like this, 
but he always panics when I start screwing with him. I pull out my phone and texted his landline. You know how it reads out texts in that weird computer voice? This is the UK. It might be different elsewhere. Anyway, I text them, I am Legion. I have come to claim your souls. In before Zom Gianon reference, it seemed appropriate. Their phone rings, they all look at it and hesitate before picking it up. I watch their faces as the computer voice begins to read the message. When it gets to the end, my cousin who was holding the phone lets it drop to his side and is clearly overcome with emotion because he begins to pace rapidly. My GF lets out a scream along with my other cousin, who begins cupping her hands around the glass of the window and peering out. Their garden is quite long, so even if she could see into the darkness, there's no chance she'd see me. I sit in the garden for about 20 minutes before I continue with my game. By this time, they're all on edge and they don't leave the living room alone. I creep round to the front of the house and send them another text. Let me in, let me in. When my cousin plays it on speakerphone, I poise by the door and when it gets to the end, I bang once on their front door, then run around to the back. I hear screams from inside the house. My cousin walks into the corridor leading to his door and calls out, Please Anon, you got us, now stop it, please! I walk up to their living room window that faces the garden and take a quick picture of them all in there, then text it to all of their phones simultaneously. I'm deep into the garden by the time they get them and realize what they are looking at. They all panic and run into my cousin's room and lock themselves in. I go to the back door, which is fortunately unlocked, and let myself in. I stand in the kitchen, listening to them cry and comfort themselves in my cousin's room. I wait there for about 15 minutes before I hear their door begin to open. My boy cousin slowly starts to venture out, having a look down the empty corridor. The kitchen is out of his line of sight. I hear him walk about halfway down. My GF whispers loudly to him, Is anyone there? To which he replies, I don't think. Before he finishes his sentence, I slam the kitchen door shut very hard, making an extremely loud bang and shaking the whole house. Their screams are glorious, and the only noise audible over them is the slamming of their door and the rebarricading of this. I then went into the corridor and took a little stuffed bear door stopper thing from behind the door and placed it in front of my cousin's room where they all were with a kitchen knife across its lap. I then snuck out the back and went home. I ate some food and watched some TV. Eventually, they called my house phone and asked me if I was at home. Obviously. The line went dead and five minutes later, they piled into my house and begged me to tell them it was me. My GF told them I had snuck round the back before I'd arrived. I just stared at her and point blank refused. I've been here this whole time, sweetie. They said they didn't believe me, but the fear was still there. Anyone else like to do shit like this? There's just a satisfaction you get from it that I don't get from anything else. What the actual fuck is wrong with you? I have one. Pretty recent. My neighbor was a huge conspiracy theorist, and this happened a few months ago. Head over to his house for the weekly beers. Door locked for once. I knock. He comes, looks more shit than usual, won't let me come in. What's wrong, Jerry? You okay, bro? I'm fine, I'm fine, you just have to go. I left him alone for a couple of days, trimming hedges outside when I hear a thumping in his house. Go knock on his door. Locked. Panic. Go around to the back door. Lock. Open a nearby window and get inside. Jerry, are you okay, man? Thumping gets louder as I get to his bedroom. He's sitting on his bed, hitting the wall with his rifle. Jerry, are you o? Oh? You can hear the marching of the war drums. What, man? Get out. I left, unlocked the back door and hoped it stayed that way. Thumping is on and off for a few days. One night it gets really loud. I ignore it. Thumping ends with a gunshot. He took his own life. Not super messed up, but it does make me sad. I personally find this creepy. Be like two. I tell my mom, do you know how I lost my hand? Holding my hand as if my pinky and ring are cut off. Explain how it got caught on a conveyor belt and how my buddy cut it off with an axe. My great-grandpa, who died about two years before I was born, had his hand cut in the same way. Mom checks with my grandma since she never knew exactly how it happened. 
Grandma verifies this. Of course, I have no recollection of this and was told later in life about it. To this day, my mom believes I'm a reincarnation of my great-grandpa. I even have the same shade of hazel eyes. My youngest cousin, when he was at the age where walking was natural, used to walk around with his hands clasped behind his back and just wander the house observing things. My grandfather did this a lot when he was bored during the last few years of his life. He lived with my aunt in the same house for those last few years and died a few years before my cousin was born. One evening, when my cousin was doing this for a more extended period of time, 20 minutes, my aunt kind of walked up to him and asked, Baba, is that you? My cousin took his hands from behind his back as if he just realized they were there and told her, No, mummy, in a tone that felt as though he had no idea what she was talking about. He never did it again, but he looked so goddamn much like my grandpa. I guess maybe I'm a bit sheltered, but here's one from fairly recently that disturbed me. Volunteering at a nursing home. A lady calls me over. There is a woman sitting beside her who is obviously in pain. Call for a doctor and ask the woman what is wrong. She just says that her friend said she needed somebody. I can tell she doesn't know what is going on. Doesn't seem bothered in the slightest. Meanwhile, her friend is begging, help me, please mister, while the doctor comes over. As the doctor takes over the situation and I walk out, the senile woman grabs me by my plaid flannel shirt. She tells me, you look so pretty wearing this, so pretty. Go home and feel sad. B16 cousin and my uncle came to visit. My cousin almost never comes to visit. We see my uncle's kids once every four or five years. Hang out with him for a few days, go out to eat. He's six or seven years older than me. He starts getting phone calls every five seconds from this girl. He explains his girlfriend is crazy. He makes her depressed. Hangs out with him one night in my grandma's house upstairs. He takes out pills, crushes them and snorts them. He snorted oxys, telling me it's because of his GF. After he snorted, hung out with him in the backyard and watched a meteor shower. Sort of bonded. Despite his pill depression shit, he was a cool guy. Funny. Loves to smoke weed and hang out and do stuff. He was happy to come up and visit and through his stay did less and less pills and seemed happier. Cousin leaves her a few more days, comes back to visit a while afterwards again. He goes to the city with my sister. He explains his mom took all of his bar mitzvah money and blew it. When her dad is rich and gives her anything, his grandfather offered jobs to his younger brother and older brother, but not him. He explains he feels left out and unwanted. He explains he's visiting because he killed his girlfriend whose father is a huge ass drug dealer where he lives and kills people and she wouldn't leave him alone. He explains that my uncle helped him hide the body. He says they're only visiting because where we live is a safe place where people don't know him and people are after him. Sister is sort of freaked out and asks him if he's going to kill her or going to try and take the car. He says no and says he feels my sister and I are the only people who aren't assholes in our family, so he told her the truth. Sister and I keep our mouth shut. He goes back to his state, then gets a life sentence for murder. That was an unexpected twist, damn. Yeah, it's sad too. Out of all my other cousins, he was pretty much the cool one who played with me since I was the youngest and would get left out. He'd help me with hide and seek, and we'd win a lot, and gave me all his Pokemon stuff when he outgrew it. Like 500 bucks worth of figures and games. And he and his brothers were spoiled always had the best toys and everything they wanted. He gave me his guitar after he got a life sentence. Since I had told him I wanted to learn how to play, he remembered, and made my aunt send it to me. It sucks. Driving in the middle of the night, some biker pulls up on the other end of the street. A random guy from a truck gets off the truck and hacks the biker with a machete a dozen times. He drives off and about 20 bikers ride by a minute later, pissed off. Ooh, what mate dot JPEG, buying some food at midnight again. Sketchy dude in front of a store, tries to start shit up with me, but sees I'm not alone. See him follow somebody else as I leave. Later hear about a dead body that was found in a backyard near the store. Friend playing with a gun. Bang, bang, headshot. Bang. The gun actually goes off while he's aiming at my head. Ears are ringing, my vision gets dark, and my body gets heavy. Almost passed out. 
He barely missed me, and I was so close I got powder burns. Get the shakes for a couple of days. Be me. Parents are out of town, and my stepbrother promised me 25 bucks if he can be gone all night and morning so he can bring his GF somewhere, stay in the classroom. Teacher leaves. I still kept studying for the test tomorrow. Janitor comes in, says they're gonna lock up soon. It's getting dark. Tell him okay. End up falling asleep somehow. Wake up. Watch says it's 3 a.m. It's spooky in here. This was years back, by the way. No fancy electronic locks or cameras anywhere. Open the door so I can get home as I live across the street. Walk to the little railing that lets you see the lobby. Bunch of dudes wearing weird black robes standing there, staring at the ground in a circle. Black cloth covering the door. What? Tiptoe away, have to use the back entrance probably. End up tripping over a cord for a vacuum. Loudest smack you can imagine. Here sprinting towards the stairs. Shit no! Decided I can't run fast enough, crawl into an open locker and quickly close it. Hide there for the rest of the night horrified. Wake up to a very confused senior staring at me. Decide not to tell anyone what happened, just accept the detention. Only other people I ever told this story to were my best friend and brother. Didn't want to get into something bigger if I told someone at the school. I still don't know who those people were. Head to toe, black robes, standing in the lobby. It's crap like this that scares me most. Ever wonder what the hell happens in some areas after dark, under the disguise of night? People doing anything knowing they won't be seen. I've walked through Manhattan at 3 a.m. before. Even though this city never sleeps, it's only the lights giving that illusion. It gets so very quiet. Kind of creepy story. My grandpa always talked about angels talking to him in his sleep. He's been talking about that kind of stuff for like 10 years before he died. My dad and I moved him to our hometown and bought him a house. We visit him once a month. Angel stories every time. He says they sit on his bed with him and they just talk like old buddies. About a year after we moved him, he wrecked his car into a telephone pole. Nervous system is shutting down completely. Entire family is flying in from around the country. We visit him in the hospital's old folks' home every day. Every day we sit there for hours and just talk to him. He isn't talking back, probably can't even hear us, or just not able to respond. Visit him on Christmas Eve. Same old thing we talk about, he doesn't respond. Family getting ready to head home. I walk up to him, hug and kiss his head and say goodbye. Grandpa love you knowing this is one of the last chances I could say it. He turns his head in a split second, looks me in the eyes and says, I love you too, be a good boy. I can see the angels. I start to bawl and walk outside. I don't like people seeing me cry. Get home and go to bed. Wake up Christmas morning, he had died early in the morning. He saw the angels coming for him. B6, I live in Hawaii with my mother and father, not married. Mom sells drugs. Dad is a mechanic for the military at Pearl Harbor. Dad gets a job as a general's aide. Dad leaves with the general to tour Europe. Meanwhile, back at home, Mom becomes a stripper. Brings back different men every week. I remember one of them putting pants I had peed in over my head and dunking me in a tub of water repeatedly. Finally, Mom loses it. Abandons me in an airport. Gives me $500 and tells me to get an express ticket to family in New York, go to the elevator. A stranger inquires about the location of my parents. Say she went home, the police called, in foster care for a week. Dad picks me up, moved to New York. Now I live with my stepmom and dad and my stepbrother. Life is okay. Driving in the rain one day, I hit a sharp, unexpected curve and losing control of the car. Car rolls a couple of times and ends up in the ditch, leaning on its side. I am hanging out of the window, with my hands braced on the ground and my lower body still in the car. The car is at about a 45 degree angle. Shit, shit, shit. It's about to roll over on me. Crawl out of the car and up out of the ditch. Lost my glasses. Can't see shit. See vague shapes of people standing on the ridge above me. Scream for help. They don't move. 
I am covered in blood and in a lot of pain, convinced I am about to drop dead. People who are thrown out of cars usually die, right? Why won't those people help me? Two or three cars go by, no one stops. Shit, I'm dead, I'm a ghost, no one can see me. Finally someone stops to help, yay, I'm not dead. Go back later to look at the scene. Nothing on the ridge, no people, no trees or poles that look like people, still have no idea what the hell that was. Easy and vanilla for me. Go to visit grandparents. Mum takes Gran out shopping. Grandad goes for a lie down, reading a book, decide to get him a cup of tea, bring it to him. He's lying there face frozen like someone in scream, clearly not breathing. No, 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 no. Ring the ambulance, get him down on the floor and perform CPR till the paramedics get there till my joints are on fire. The paramedics say I got his pulse back and say good job, but he died in hospital an hour later. Happened only a few months ago. The kicker is, I am currently undergoing treatment for a panic disorder that's made me shut in for five years. At that moment I was fine, after I couldn't sleep thinking he died because I didn't hear him yell at me or something and should have gotten there sooner. Turns out, he had a very odd type of pneumonia with no outward symptoms, but his lungs were completely clogged shut and his kidneys were rotted. Clearly, he had been suffering with it for weeks and not even noticed beyond feeling tired. On one hand, it was a relief to know that there was literally nothing I could have done at that point. On the other hand, the idea of us not even knowing we are sick and just dying because we run out of breath terrifies me. Even now I think of him, lying there, his breath getting weaker and weaker, maybe trying and failing to yell for help, maybe just thinking, this is my death then, eh, and fading out. Reminds me how quickly a human life is snuffed out, or because maybe he had a bath that was too cold or something. I love you, Grandad. I miss you every day. My close grandpa died a couple years ago. That feels so weird to say. From a blood clot in his leg or something. It was just so random out of nowhere like yours. My dad woke me up and told me, and I wasn't able to comprehend it at the time. I don't think I have ever cried as much as when I realized what was going on. The worst part was that the paramedics took like 15 to 20 minutes to get there, when it wasn't but a five-minute drive. We are all just so fragile and can die at any given moment. That is what is truly scary to me. This isn't all that scary, but was damn weird at the time. Working as a process server. Delivering subpoenas, summonses to individuals and businesses. I just wrapped up a serve, but don't have a pen. Stop at the hospital, realise it's an asylum, kind of get weirded out, but whatever. Walk to the front lobby, see some commotion inside. Whatever, walk in the lobby. Immediately see Jude biting some chick viciously. The girl runs to the corner and starts crying. The doctor sees me and yells, stay out! Two guys immediately grab the Jude and toss him ass over the tea kettle onto the ground. I do a 360 and walk away. Screw mental hospitals! This is the final warning for the last two stories in tonight's broadcast. I grew up with a mom with chronic pain. She takes narcotics all the time every day since I was born. Never think anything of it until I get older. When I'm a preteen, I started to worry about my mom's drug abuse. She tosses it aside, saying she needs them for pain. When in reality, she was on so many she was going through withdrawal all the time. Final day of grade 13. Finish an exam. Call mom, tell her I'm going to a friend's house. Come home at around 3 p.m. She never did call me. Her bedroom door is closed. I thought she went for a nap. Go for a nap, too. Wake up. She's still not awake. Hear some moaning. Open her bedroom door. She's lying there, bloated. She's dripping in sweat. Her eyes rolled into the back of her head. There was blood all over the pillow like she vomited. She was still alive, breathing very fast and shallow. Shake her, yell at her to wake up. No response. Run to neighbors, call the police. Go back home and sit on the bed with my vegetable mother waiting for them, crying. The ambulance comes and they start working on her. After this happens, mom is still alive in the intensive care unit. Doctors think she didn't have enough oxygen going to her brain. She's basically brain dead. I go every day to visit her. She can't do anything on her own. I tell her I love her and I ask her if she loves me. She manages to nod, there are tears in her eyes. Knew then what had to be done. Convince grandparents to agree to make the decision to take her off life support. Three days later, I got a phone call saying she died. I remember walking into her hospital room, opened the curtain, 
All of her stuff is packed up. She's laying there on her back, gray. Her eyes and her mouth are open and she is cold. Gather the rest of her things in a bag while she lays there stiff. Kiss her and tell her I love her. The next time I see her, she is ash. Sorry to hear that. I had to find my dad dead too. I was 26. He had cancer and had been trying to fight it for months. Three of my brothers and I lived with him to try and help him when we could. Near the end, it got so bad, he was not coherent most of the time and could barely talk, let alone understand anything anyone was saying. The night before he died, I watched a movie with him, even though he slept through most of it and did not talk almost at all. Before I went to sleep, I said, love you, dad. He struggled for a minute with his eyes closed, but still managed to say quietly, love you too. I woke up at three in the morning out of nowhere. I almost never wake up in the middle of the night. I went to check on him, and he was not breathing. I honestly believe my dad dying woke me up. I don't know why I'm posting this now. It is not something I usually share, but your story reminded me of it. Not my story, but a story my martial arts teacher told me. Martial arts teacher, also a high school physics teacher, was teaching as a substitute for an elementary school somewhere in rural Illinois a few years back. He had to teach there pretty much every day because the teacher was gone for a long ass time and nobody else could sub. There was one little boy, 10 years old at the time, who would randomly crawl under his desk and lay in the fetal position staring into space. At the end of the year, he asks what was up with him. Other teachers tell him the story. He had a brother, sister, mother of course, and an alcoholic father. One day the dad calls the family for a family meeting in the living room on the sofa. Everyone except dad is sitting on the sofa. Dad gets a fucking crossbow, shoots everyone except his youngest son, the boy, in the head with the crossbow, then says, I hope you can live with this for the rest of your life. Shoots himself in the head with the crossbow. Kid is scarred for life and is being taken care of by his grandma or something. He should be around 18 by now. Wonder what the fuck happened with him. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time. Remember to check out the Odyssey page in the description for a second archive of the channel's videos. There's also a Rumble archive as a backup.